Uh, I know that many of us have been impacted by our, our guest today in his writing. This is his first time uh, to be with us and, and to preach for us, but uh, we were letting him know just a little while ago that long before he came here in person, that his writing has had a great impact into the life of, uh, of, of many of us. Uh, I personally have had uh, Pastor Mark's writing, especially his nine marks, uh, you know, church training, church um, developing, just writing, just be an incredible impact in my life, and I'm just so grateful for him. He's the pastor of Capitol Hill Baptist Church in the D.C. area. He and his wife, Connie, and their two children have just faithfully served there. He's also an author and a speaker, and always, always uh, just one of the favorites at the Together for the Gospel Conference, which if you haven't signed up for and you want to be a part of, uh, Pastor Mark might give you some insight about. But uh, can we just put our hands together for Pastor Mark? Dever. Thank you, David, for the privilege of being here, and thank you. And um, wow, sorry about that. Uh, I guess you're used to watching people speak to you on all sides, and that's great. Um, it's a joy to be able to address uh, a group of young people like this. Thank you for taking time out of your day. If you have your Bibles with you, open them to Mark chapter 12, or turn them on and scroll to Mark chapter 12. Um, I want to look at just five verses there. Mark chapter 12, beginning at verse 13. Mark chapter 12, beginning at verse 13. Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Friends, I want to make three basic observations from this text. The first thing that we should note from this is that Christians are good citizens. Christians are good citizens, at least we should be. We get this from the surprising first half of Jesus' answer there in verse 17. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Now, I say surprising not because these words are surprising to you. These are some of the most famous words of Jesus. Uh, people all over the world, people who've never even uh, considered themselves Christians have heard of these words of Jesus, but because at the time he spoke them, they were unexpected, even startling. This is how Jesus got out of the rhetorical checkmate that these corrupt leaders had tried to put him in. Uh, if you understand the situation he's in, this is in the last week of Jesus' earthly teaching. He is enormously popular. Many of the religious leaders of the temple in Jerusalem are concerned by that popularity. They don't like Jesus. They think he's dangerous. They think he's leading a rebellion that's going to upset their comfortable, secure position in Jerusalem. So they devise this question. We will ask him publicly whether or not taxes should be paid to the occupying forces because we win either way. If he says that taxes shouldn't be paid, which is what they thought he was going to say, then we show he's a revolutionary and we can then turn to the Roman authorities to do away with him. On the other hand, in the unlikely event, he says it's okay to pay taxes, we take the air out of the revolution and while we won't get the Romans to deal with them then, at least everybody will be disillusioned and he won't be so popular anymore. So they thought they had created the master question. But friends, too many people, I think, admire Jesus' rhetorical dexterity here and miss what he's actually teaching. This is more than simply a clever answer. In this short answer, Jesus picked up a biblical theology of government and he applied it to the new phase in the history of God's people that Jesus himself was commencing. 
And while it's going to too far to say that Jesus' statement here established a wall of separation between church and state, or made the state secular, I think Jesus' affirmation of paying taxes to the Roman government does show that a pagan state may be legitimate. Jesus looked at his followers, and speaking of Rome, he said, pay for it. I remember once being asked by a friend who was a president of the Free Society, the Libertarian Society at Cambridge University, where I was studying in England 20 years ago. He was asking me to give a, a message on the Christian view, does society need a state? And so I spent time preparing, and as I studied for that, I was impressed by what a deeply biblical thing human government is. Human government is not legitimate fundamentally because the government controls the army and the police, kind of might makes right. Human government is not legitimate fundamentally because of a social contract somewhere back in the mystical myths of time. Human government is not legitimate fundamentally because of an election. You know, vox populi, vox dei, the voice of the people is the voice of God. Human government is not legitimate fundamentally because of a Marxist idea of inevitability or merely for economic necessity or some psychological need we all have to be controlled. Now, let's think for a moment about what the Bible teaches about human government and put Jesus' teaching here in the larger context of what God has revealed. The story of government begins as soon as human history does. In the first chapter of the Bible, we find what we find there is that human government reflects God's initial charge to fill the earth and subdue it. Fill the earth and subdue it. Almost any government is better than anarchy. Now, the Roman government of Jesus' day was despotic. But even so, the Roman government was still fulfilling the role of providing order and some measure of justice. Government does good by maintaining and providing order, peace, providing a stage for us to obey God's commands, to fill the earth and subdue it, to live, as we read in 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So God teaches us in the Bible that He is sovereign and that the state is the servant of God in very particular ways, and that's why Christians can usually obey the state. Authority, by its very nature, reflects God. Now, please listen to that particularly, because the current generation is not apt to hear that very often because of abuses of authority that are so prominent. But be aware, according to the Bible, authority reflects the nature of God. I love King David's last words in 2 Samuel chapter 23. When one rules over men in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, he is like the light of morning at sunrise on a cloudless morning, like the brightness after the rain that brings grass from the earth. This is how it is that, as Proverbs 13, 14 says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. And why the Lord Almighty told his Israelites in exile in Babylon in Jeremiah 29 to seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Friends, the purpose of all government should be to bless those within the scope of its power and responsibility. And as Paul says in Romans 13, to be an agent of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. So, all government has power only as God entrusts it to them. So, Jesus would say in just a couple of days after this to Pilate, the Roman governor, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. What's the longest single passage in the New Testament on government? Somebody just yell it out. Just the reference in Scripture. Longest single passage on government. Romans 13, exactly. Those first seven verses in Romans. Turn over there for a second. Romans chapter 13, verse 7. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. 
And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. And that's consistent with what Paul instructs Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, where he urges Timothy to pray for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So Peter writes in 1 Peter 1.23, or rather in, in 1 Peter 2.13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right, Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. So friends, as Christians, we believe that government is one of a number of enterprises that we can be involved in that are not specifically Christian, but that are good and can mediate the blessings of God's own authority in this life. So if you're here here today and you're not a Christian, I wonder how all this sounds to you. Do you really think that unfettered self-interest is a better basis for society? For all our sins, I think that history shows again and again that Christians are good for a country. All people are made in God's image. We're to display His image to each other. And Christians are actually called and enabled by God to live out that love in a way more fully than we were able to before we were Christians. That is, as Christians, we're called to live a better, a more full life, which we should be doing by being a blessing to those around us. So, the Bible supports the implication of Jesus' exhortation here to pay for even non-Christian governments, because by the nature of what they do, governments are made to be good, they are made to reflect God's own authority. So. Christian. The the members of my congregation in Capitol Hill, we're right on Capitol Hill, we're four blocks behind the Supreme Court. Uh, Most of the members of our congregation work in the government. Uh, They mainly work in the legislative branch, though some in the executive and in the judicial. But I I want them to be encouraged about what they're doing. I think they should be as Christians. They are doing God's work. In fact, whatever sphere you're in, you are called to exercise authority as a reflection of God's own authority. Now, certainly those who are in authority should reflect and uphold the morality that God has created us all to have in order to reflect His character. So, even when governments support immorality and sin, as every government since the fall has done in one way or another, please realize that, every government in one way or another since the fall has supported immorality and sin. Even then, we are at least normally to continue to support that government, even as we work to correct and improve it. We should be very slow to conclude that this or that particular sin propagated or immorality affirmed vacates the rightful authority of the government. Personally, this means that Christians are to be law-abiding and tax-paying. That's to mark us. We should be honest in it all. We should thank God for the good that there is in our government, establishing justice, protecting religious freedom, promoting peace. We want to encourage each other to give to Caesar what is Caesar's by working to improve life in our neighborhood as God gives us opportunity to preach and display His gospel in our living. So it's in our nature as Christians to be good citizens. That's my first observation. But no earthly kingdom is to be identified uniquely with God's people. Because now, and here's my second observation, Christians are international. Christians are international. Jesus' approval of paying taxes to Rome here was revolutionary. 
By this, he shows us that the legitimacy of a government is not determined by whether it supports the worship of the one true God or even allows for it. By Jesus not requiring of those who would follow him only to support states which are formally allied to the one true God, like Israel in the Old Testament had been, Jesus unhitches following him from being a part of any particular nation. Think about it for a minute. If Christians can support Rome, what government should we not support? This is the government that killed Christ and almost all the apostles. This is what Jesus is saying. This government should be supported by paying taxes. Jesus is not presenting himself as a theonomist in this world. That is, someone who thinks the Bible should simply be legislated. When Jesus says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, when he tells him to pay taxes, he shows that that's not what he's saying. You remember what Jesus would say to Pilate in just a couple of days in John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. Now, Christ was bringing his kingdom to this world, and that would culminate in his return and his direct and personal rule. But until then... His people would be under the reign of all sorts of kings and emperors, as Joseph and Daniel had been in the Old Testament, as Christ himself was. And all such reigns of kings and congresses would be temporary. But Christians could survive. We're like cockroaches. And to the very end, to varying degrees, we can support the government by obeying Jesus here, giving to Caesar what is Caesar's. So again, this means that God's people will not be building a single nation, which alone will have legitimacy before God, but rather God's people will be international. Jesus teaches here that his followers will not be like the Jewish state had been, nor like Roman and other pagan states had been, allied to the worship of particular gods. Now, if you're not very familiar with Christianity, this may surprise you. I understand that. I've lived overseas. Maybe you thought Christianity was simply an American thing. But for the international nature of Christ's church today, spread as it is all over the world, and as it has been historically, shows that it's never been just an American thing. It's never been just a Western thing. In fact, from its very earliest beginnings, the worship of the one true God has always been something that's been envisioned for all nations. Where where would you go in the Old Testament to, to, to show this? Where would you begin showing this? Other than Genesis 1, creation. We've got that. But beyond creation, where would you go? I want a text. Say what? 12. You're saying Genesis 12? Yeah, exactly. He calls Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees. So he calls Abram out of Iraq. A- Abram is just a, he's just a, uh, a, a regular idolater there. But God calls him, and he promises him in Genesis 12, 3, that through him all nations on earth will be blessed. So this was foreshadowed every time a Gentile in the Old Testament then was included in the covenant community in cases like Rahab or Ruth. So you could see glimmers of this international nature of God's people in the examples of of Joseph down in Egypt or Daniel over in Babylon, continuing to faithfully serve the God of Israel. But really, it's here in the New Testament, in the ministry of Jesus, that he turns his followers to the nations. So the Great Commission, Matthew 28, his final instructions, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And friends, this is exactly what we see beginning to happen at Pentecost, where God's Spirit was poured out on who? On people from various nations. This is the story that we follow throughout the book of Acts as we watch the church expand out from Jerusalem to the Samaritans in chapter 8, to the Gentiles in chapter 10, and through the missionary journeys in the eastern Mediterranean on even to Paul at Rome, taking the gospel from there then on to the rest of the world. And we know from the book of Revelation that God's international purpose for the church will be accomplished. There's no threat of it not happening. We have prophecy in Scripture that it will happen. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. The heavenly creatures praise the Lamb 
because with your blood you purchased men from God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And later in Revelation 7, John writes, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Friends, this is why you should care about and pray for Christians from all around the world. Our families will reflect this international nature of Christ's church as people from different ethnic backgrounds date and marry, as a Filipino woman marries an African-American man, as Jews marry Gentiles, as Asians date non-Asians, as Americans and non-Americans wed and have children and adopt orphans from other countries. You see how all of this, appropriate in itself, can specially reflect the international character of the nature of Christ's church. And it's not just in our families, it's in our friendships. We begin to realize that in Christ we have more in common with others who are redeemed, even if they are from someplace else. So if you're here today as a Christian who is an American, I assume you realize that as much as we have in common with our non-Christian American friends, we've got even more in common with Christian brothers and sisters from Africa and from Great Britain and from the Caribbean. So, we call each other brothers and sisters, and we pray for Christians who are under oppressive governments, and we give our lives to try to get the gospel to all nations, even if that means sacrificing some of the comforts that we've come to know and be accustomed to here in America. So in our local churches, we try to give more and more of our money away to make the gospel of Jesus Christ known around the world. David was telling me about some of the mission trips that you guys are involved in to try to do exactly this, try to take the gospel to all nations. Friends, that's exactly in line with what Jesus teaches here. We pray that even these very relationships that we have with people not just like us, but who are together with us in Christ, we pray that these relationships will provoke the interest of those outside of Christ and so be used to display the gospel to those around us. Friends, Christians are international. Jesus could have just said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and left it at that. They would have had their answer. But it's interesting to me that Jesus goes on. Notice the other thing he says. This is my third observation. Number three, Christians are finally accountable to God. Christians are finally accountable to God. This is the convicting second half. Give to God what is God's. Even by saying this, Jesus contradicted what was said on the very denarius that they were considering, this coin they had presented and mentioned to him. This coin proclaimed that the emperor Tiberius was the son of the divine Augustus. Jesus was clearly distinguishing between Caesar and God. Caesar is not God. Jesus' followers would obey the state, but they would not worship the state. Christians are good citizens, as I mentioned that first observation. But by teaching this, Jesus gives an important additional note because Christians are accountable finally to God. Our duty to the earthly authority is limited. No earthly authority will perfectly reflect the character and authority of God. And we can see this when these authorities clash. So that's what's going on in the disobedience of Adam and Eve in the garden. This was the most revolutionary disobedience in all of human history. And since then, this pattern of rebelling against God's authority has continued. It's well represented in Scripture by a number of pagan rulers. So in Exodus chapter 5, Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Now think for a moment. Pharaoh was a legitimate ruler of Egypt, but his authority was being abused by opposing God himself. So the psalmist can pray in Psalm 119, redeem me from the oppression of men that I may obey your precepts. Not all authority is used for good. And for instance, I'm speaking to a bunch of young people. Let me just tell you, if you have been the subject 
of authority abused in any sense, talk to others about that. Open up, be honest. What I'm saying is not saying that all authority is good. I'm saying all authority is given for a good end to reflect the character of God, not that in a fallen world all authority is actually used for good. Pray that God would give you wisdom to know who you could speak to about that abuse of authority in your own life. In the New Testament, we see with Jesus' own disciples after his ascension that they feel this clash between the authorities. In Acts chapter 4, the Sanhedrin ordered Peter and John not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. So what are they going to do? Aren't they supposed to render to Caesar what is Caesar's? Yeah, but the Sanhedrin's gone a little beyond that here. And so Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. And then in the next chapter, they disobeyed that instruction, and so they're again brought before the Sanhedrin, and they order them again, and we read in Acts 5, 29, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than man. Friends, you've got to have that pretty deep in your Christianity, especially if we're going into a period where the government is going to oppose us in some very specific ways. Our church was founded in 1878 in the same corner that we're still on, four blocks behind the Supreme Court. We've been there for a long time. We were founded in our statement of faith with 18 articles. The 16th article reads, we believe that civil government is of divine appointment for the interests and good order of human society, and that magistrates are to be prayed for, conscientiously honored, and obeyed, except only in things opposed to the will of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only Lord of the conscience and the Prince of the kings of the earth. You got to have that last bit in there. So if Romans 13 tells us about the goodness of authority, Revelation 13 gives us a picture of what happens when the state clashes with God and opposes Him and persecutes Christians. And of course, we we can't be surprised at that. Jesus had already told His disciples back in Mark chapter 8, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He was about to teach them in John 15, remember the words I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Friends, the Bible is clear that all people are made in the image of God and that people are all fallen and sinful and guilty before God. Friends, this is one of the problems with referring to any country as a Christian nation. Just because the principles of Christianity clearly influenced our nation's founders, and some of them were themselves evangelical Christians, like Virginia's own Patrick Henry. And even if the Supreme Court has recognized the long history of significant Christian influence in our nation, that does not mean that today most Americans are Christians, or that a Christian worldview dominates our public culture, or dominates our government today, or that one needs to be a Christian in order to be an American citizen. Augustine understood the complexities we find ourselves in when he spoke of the Christian simultaneously being a citizen of two cities, the city of man and the city of God. So the legal establishment of Christianity in many nations centuries after the apostles reflected an already distorted understanding of the gospel and led to terrible confusions as the church wielded the sword in religious wars and inquisitions. I wonder if you know 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Christians' identification of their own modern nation with Israel here in 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is well intended, but it's confusing. We have no specific promises like this for any modern nation state in the world today. Though, of course, we should always repent, and God may well in His mercy and grace bless any land. So even if we have presidents who are Christians, the authority of our government will never be perfectly used. We pray for our leaders that God would help us be good stewards of the blessings that He's entrusted to our nations, and we try to stay on guard against the allure of worldly power. We know worldly power isn't perfect. We know worldly power will vanish. I love John Wesley's memory toward the end of his life. He's reflecting on being 
uh, with the king when he's preparing to address the Houses of Parliament uh, in, in the annual state address. And he says, I was in the robe chamber adjoining to the House of Lords when the king put on his robes. His brow was much furrowed with age and quite clouded with care. And is this all the world can give even to a king? All the grandeur it can afford? A blanket of ermine around his shoulders, so heavy and cumbersome he can scarce move under it? A huge heap of borrowed hair with a few plates of gold and glittering stones upon his head? Alas, what a bauble is human greatness, and even this will not endure. Friends, I've been pastoring the same church for 22 years. When I got there, I was the age of the grandchildren of the people I was preaching to. Now the congregation's age is your age and about four or five years older. They're mainly in their 20s, and I've aged deeply into my 50s. I'm now the age of their parents, or a little more. They come, and they're anxious, and they want to be on Capitol Hill, many of them. Some of them aspire to be elected to public office. Some of them get elected to public office. I now have friends younger than me elected as representatives and senators. And you know, some of those will even get to be reelected if they're very, very successful. Uh, there was one man who was a member of our church when I first got there who was chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, one of the most important committees in our government. He had been in the Senate for over 30 years. He was celebrated nationally in a number of ways. You know, I asked a few years ago in a sermon if anybody knew this man's name. Almost no one in the congregation of a thousand people knew his name. You walk around Capitol Hill and you see great statues. I mean, if you're reelected a bunch of times, you don't even get a great statue. Finally, if you do something great in, in a crux point of history, you may get a great statue. And people look up and they go, who's that? What a bauble is human greatness. And even that will not endure. We should certainly take from Jesus' second phrase here, a reminder that we should obey God rather than any boss we might ever have that would tell us to do something wrong, and that includes the state. So should we obey the state when it tells us you can't spank a child lovingly, but that you can abort an infant in the womb? Should we obey that state in that? The state has important authority, but it is limited whenever it conflicts with God's authority. So, brothers and sisters, questions of how and when we should disobey the state should be thought through very carefully and with Scripture study and reflection and prayer and counsel. But in a fallen world, we can never rule such actions always necessarily wrong. And in our local churches, we can pray for wisdom in political matters. Also, though we have to allow differences in what party people are members of. Your local church should resist identifying the gospel with any nation or with any political party in any nation. Even as we look forward and pray for the day when God again rules us immediately, and fallible earthly authority is no more. Though our duty to our earthly authority is limited, notice this other thing here, that our, our duty to God is comprehensive. He says, give to God what is God's. Praise God that earthly governments don't have the last say. In a fallen world, legal is not the same thing as moral, nor is illegal the same thing as immoral. Earthly authority must be humble, remembering that it is not ultimate. In the Great Commission, Jesus taught that all authority is His. That's why Jesus would go on and say in Mark 12, talking about a loving Lord, loving the Lord with all that you are and have. You see, Jesus wasn't fundamentally a, a revolutionary against Rome. He was an even more radical revolutionary. He was leading a revolution against the dominion of sin in all of us. You see, when Jesus points out Caesar's ownership of that which bears Caesar's image, he's already implied that since we are made in the image of God, all we have is due to God. Jesus came to remake us in His image. All we have is only ours in a secondary and temporary sense. So we do have an obligation to the state, and that obligation to the state is just part of our larger responsibility to God with our whole lives, because we are His creation, and we will all be judged by Him. And especially because we Christians have been created again by Him. We've been twice over bought at a price. 
So you see, back behind and below and above the obligation to the state, the authority of Caesar is the authority of God. We know from Daniel 7 that all rulers will worship and obey the Most High. Colossians 1.16 tells us that of Christ, that by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. But the temporary and imperfect rule of earthly authorities will one day be absorbed back into God's direct rule. So all authority belongs to Christ, as we see throughout the Gospels, as everything from evil spirits to the winds and the waves obey Him. They recognize His authority, and this implies our duty to obey Christ completely. And do understand this. This wasn't just a theology of the government. This was an indictment against the religious leaders who were listening to him on that day. Give that answer. If you know your Gospels well, and all the Synoptic Gospels right before this is the parable of the wicked tenants, where Jesus tells this parable about the man who had left the vineyard in charge of some people, and those people ended up killing his sons. They owed God as the owner all that they were and had, and Jesus was that son, and they, as the tenants in the parable had done, they were rejecting Him. You could say that Jesus was the son come to collect what was due, and that they, these religious leaders who were asking Him this question, were refusing to pay, so judgment would come. But friends, don't sit and think self-righteously about the evil of these ancient religious leaders and think you're off the hook. This is an indictment on us. There is no one of us here who has lived his or her life fully for what God intended us to do. We have appeared to obey God when we have agreed with what He's wanted us to do. And then those other times we've shown too often who we really obey, ourselves, and what we want to do. We will all give an account to God, and this should drive us to Christ not just as our Lord, but as our Savior. Friend, if you're here and you're not a Christian, the wonderful news of Christianity isn't about government. It's about what God does with people who have offended and broken His laws, and that's all of us. God has in His great love sent His only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life of trust in Him that we should have lived and none of us have. He died on the cross as a sacrifice, as a substitute, in the place of all of us who would turn from our sins and trust in Him. And God raised him from the dead to show that he accepted this sacrifice. And he calls on all of us now to turn from our sins and trust in him. And he would give us a new life. Forgive us and adopt us. And that's the great news of Christianity. The fact that we should give to God what is God's means that we should look to God to instruct us in all of life. Colossians 3:17, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Brothers and sisters, I hope you understand this very early in your life, that your whole life, every day, every hour, is to be offered to God as part of your worship of Him. I don't care how enthusiastic you are when you're singing a song or a hymn. If you've got your hands in the air and sincere emotion in your heart and tears rolling down your cheek, if you're being sexually immoral, you're not worshiping God. You're like these hypocritical religious leaders Jesus is condemning. You worship God 24-7 with every breath He gives you. And your sincere praise may sound like the hypocrites next to you, but your sincere praise is offered to God out of a heart knowing not your righteousness. You're no more righteous than I am. No, but it's the righteousness of Christ has been given to you by faith, and you've accepted it, and you rejoice in that. You rejoice in God accepting you as His child, and you do that throughout all of your life in every role He calls you to fulfill. Pray for me as a preacher of God's Word that I would understand and apply the Bible well. Faithful preachers want to teach God's Word in such a way that we will instruct you in every area of your life. We want you to be able to read Hebrews 13, 17, which says, remember your leaders who spoke the Word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith, because God is the Lord of every area of our lives. When Abraham Kuyper was opening the Free University of Amsterdam, he gave a speech in which he famously said 
There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Our duty to God is comprehensive. Give to God what is God's. Everything is God's. So does Christianity have a vision for the state or for the society as a whole? I think that the Bible has shown us that God has a wonderful vision for his world. We've rejected that vision, and yet even given that rejection, God has in mercy and love continued to pursue us. And so Jesus Christ, his only son, stood there teaching the very people that would in a few days' time seek his life and beat him and have him put to death. There are Marxist and Muslim utopian visions of our world. There are secular visions too. But none of these visions sufficiently take into account our sinfulness or God's goodness or God's love or God's justice. Utopian visions of nations and government, of politics or the state, always lead to terrible distortions of God's will, to tyranny and to corruption. It is the truth of Christianity about God being holy and loving, our being made in God's image and yet fallen, about God's provision and promises for us in Christ. It's all these truths that can lead us to sufficiently respect the fallen governments of the world and yet give us hope to endure them and to work in hope for something better, something infinitely better. And so God gives us the peace that comes with that hope and the strength to get up another day, to continue following that Jesus until he brings us home when we can be done with either being or obeying this Caesar. So friends, go ahead and give to Caesar what is Caesar's. But then make sure that you give to God what is God's. And my friend, you belong to God, all of you. Let's pray. Lord God, as serious as you are, you are even more wonderful and delightful. Teach us these truths from your word by your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.